Hello everyone, this is Jen and I make useful English lit study videos on Shakespeare, poetry, fiction, literary devices and more to help you get top grades in the subject. In this video today we are going to be doing a quick quote analysis on the strange case of Dr Jekyll and Mr Hyde. So I already have a couple of videos on this text which I will link to in the description box below but over the past few months I've received quite a lot of requests from some of you guys to do more videos on this novel. So that's exactly what I'll be doing and um, my plan is to run a series of quick quote analysis just on this novel. So in this video we are going to be looking at actually the very first paragraph of this book and it's a significant paragraph because it portrays the character and personality of Mr. Utterson. So Mr. Utterson is the lawyer who isn't exactly the narrator but his point of view is very much the point of view from which we see Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde and understand just kind of the backstory of what goes on in this novel. So Mr. Utterson is kind of like the centralizing filter for us to understand all the incidents and other characters in this book. So I'm going to now read out this extract but if you wish to read it out yourself then feel free to jump ahead to the part where we dive straight into the analysis. Mr. Utterson the lawyer was a man of a rugged countenance that was never lighted by a smile cold, scanty, and embarrassed in discourse, backward in sentiment, lean, long, dusty, dreary, and yet somehow lovable. At friendly meetings, and when the wine was to his taste, something eminently human beaconed from his eye, something indeed which never found its way into his talk, but which spoke not only in the silent symbols of the after-dinner face, but more often and loudly in the acts of his life. He was austere with himself, drank gin when he was alone, to mortify taste for vintages, and though he enjoyed the theatre, had not crossed the doors of one for twenty years. He had an approved tolerance for others, sometimes wondering, almost with envy, at the high pressure of spirits involved in their misdeeds, and in any extremity inclined to help rather than to reprove. I incline to Cain's heresy, he used to say quaintly. I'll let my brother go to the devil in his own way. This character, it was frequently his fortune to be the last reputable acquaintance and the last good influence in the lives of down-going men. And to such as these, so long as they came about his chambers, he never marked a shade of change in his demeanour. So just to give us a prompt so that we can narrow our focus of what to look at for this passage, starting from this extract, explore how Stevenson presents Utterson as a reliable character. So basically, this question is asking us to focus on Utterson's reliability and how he is a trustworthy character based on this extract that we've just read. So as always, the most important thing with any sort of prose analysis or any sort of literary analysis essay that you're going to write is that you're able to come up with a main argument, which basically means what the author is trying to say about the topic given in the question and how the writer tries to portray or convey whatever message or topic is included in the question. So your main argument is going to be incredibly important in any essay that you write. For this passage, I've decided that my main argument would include a couple of points. The way I see it, Mr. Utterson is introduced at the very beginning of the novel as this figure of moderation and balance. And why is it important for Stevenson to bring in this neutralizing figure who's kind of nondescript and clearly not quite the protagonist? So his muted, subdued characterization is important because it functions as this sort of sobering force in a novel that is otherwise very much dominated by extreme contrasting and bizarre characters right and of course those are dr jekyll and his doppelganger mr hyde so the writer then deliberately paints utterson in this kind of drab colorless light right but he's drab and and kind of boring but we see that he is essentially a decent and moral character and that's super important right because he provides this sort of counterpoint of normalcy and goodness against the sort of chaotic personalities that is going to lie ahead in the narrative so despite the fact that artisan is kind of uneventful and unexciting the fact that he is morally decent and very much 
this kind of trustworthy character is what makes us believe in him as a reliable observer and reporter of the events as this character on the sideline. So that is my main argument for this essay. And one key point to note before we go on to analyze the techniques in the passage is that whatever techniques, stylistic, structural, formal, whatever, whatever technique we go on to analyze, we have to make sure that we are connecting the technique to our main argument. And essentially what that means is we need to be showing how the technique we're analyzing help illustrate our ideas, which of course is going to be covered by our main argument. So always remember, whatever literary technique we go on to analyze, you have to ultimately tie it back to how the technique serves to illustrate our main argument, okay? So now that we're clear, let's jump straight into our first technique, and that's syntax. When you look at the two sentences that I've highlighted, you notice that they're quite long. We call them complex sentences. So a complex sentence is a sentence with multiple clauses, basically. So just as a refresher, a clause is a fragmented expression that cannot stand alone grammatically as an independent sentence, right? So for example, cold, scanty, and embarrassed in discourse cannot stand alone as an independent full sentence, right? So because it's missing a subject and also a verb. We see from these two complex sentences, there's a gradual buildup in the clauses and there's a gradual buildup in the length and also the rhythm of the clauses, right? As we can see it being created by this increase in the clause length and also the frequent pauses created by the punctuation marks, right? So for example, Mr. Utterson, the lawyer was a man of a rugged countenance that was never lighted by a smile. So these are rather even clause length, but immediately we get this monosyllabic word cold, scanty and embarrassing discourse, backward in sentiment, and then a series of very short clauses, lean, long, dusty, dreary, and yet somehow lovable. So you see that there is very much a sort of rhythmic variation here and this sort of kind of spontaneous ricocheting of rhythm created by the different clause lengths. So what does the syntactical variation and the multi-clausal structure of these sentences tell us about Artis and Kiss character? So first of all, we see from this rhythm, kind of this like gradual build up, right, the steady build up in rhythm of each of these complex sentences that maybe it sort of mirrors Utterson's measured, tempered nature. And it tells us also that he is a man who is someone to think things through step by step. So kind of like step after step after step, as we can see clause after clause after clause, right? And so he's not someone who's easily given to spontaneous whims um, and someone who is more partial to thinking things in a kind of a slow, more drawn out, more careful way. Perhaps we can think about the nature of these complex sentences and link that to the nature of Artisan's character. Apart from being complex sentences, these are also actually periodic sentences. What is a periodic sentence? It's a sentence which delays the main idea to the very end. Basically, it's a sentence that doesn't really tell us the main point until we get to the very end of it. So, right? so, so this sentence might span a couple of lines until we realize at the end that, oh, actually the point isn't quite what we've been expecting. Actually, there's another literary device for that. It's called parapostokian, which is this surprise at the end. But anyway, in this case, let's just settle for periodic sentence, which is very much what these sentences that I've highlighted are examples of. So this periodic nature kind of gives us more insights into Utterson's character. So for example, in the first sentence that I've highlighted, it tells us that he is a dry person, but he is actually quite personable and, and someone who is quite well liked. Right? We see at the start of the sentence, it's almost all kind of negative traits, saying that he's one to never really smile, he's quite cold, easily embarrassed, has these sort of old fashioned views, right? And he's like kind of dusty and dreary. And yet he is somehow, for all of his kind of negative traits, he's yet he's somehow lovable as a character. And um, also the second sentence that I've highlighted, the one that starts with he was austere with himself, etc., also tells us that he's actually not someone who's immune to temptations. He's only human because he does enjoy alcohol. He does enjoy, you know, the spectacle of theatre, which is kind of an indication of him being someone who does like to have indulgences. But he is a disciplined character, right? Because we see, and though he enjoyed the theatre, had not crossed the doors of one for 20 years, right? So clearly it tells us that, well, he's someone who is able to practice restraint. And so this is really interesting because the syntactical delay 
of the periodic sentence also reflects this notion of delayed gratification, which is very much apparently we see Mr. Utterson to be someone who is capable of. He's capable of delaying gratification and practicing restraint. And that's actually mirrored through the sort of delayed syntactical structure. But the bigger thematic message is that actually people aren't always what they seem to be on the surface, right? So Mr. Utterson, he seems kind of boring and yet he's quite likable. That's important, not so much because it tells us that Utterson is someone whom we shouldn't judge by his appearance, but it hints at how Jekyll, um, despite having this public reputation for being a celebrated and decent and upright man, is actually hiding an evil core, which of course he has to express and purge through his evil doppelganger, Mr. Hyde. So that's syntax. So juxtaposition, uh, as we know, is basically placing a, a contrasting set of ideas next to each other. So juxtaposition as a trope, right, in general in this novel, and when you think about it, is important. Because when you think about it, essentially the entire novel is one big juxtaposition, right? That between Jekyll and Hyde and the forces of good versus those of evil. And so the juxtaposition here in this first passage kind of sets us up for the overarching duality between Jekyll and Hyde's opposing relationship and nature. But it also actually highlights Utterson's role and his in-between positioning as a mediator between not just the Jekyll and Hyde kind of uh, dichotomy and opposition, but actually a mediator for other characters as well, including Dr. Lanyon uh, and Richard Enfield, his friend. So the first set of contrasts and juxtaposition that we see here is between talk and acts and silent and loudly, as you can see from the words that I have that I have set out in bold and also underlined. So this set of juxtaposition reinforces once again the impression of Mr. Utterson as someone who is actually more substance than bluster. He may seem quite subdued and quiet and and boring on the surface, but what we don't see from that is depth and decency underneath. But it also raises the question of how much outward appearances are a true approximation of someone's character. So this very much kind of ties in with our previous point. This is important for the Jekyll and Hyde sort of public versus private split that we're going to encounter later, because of course we know Jekyll outwardly, he seems to be this good man, but Hyde is this person who just murders innocent children and elderly people without any sort of compunction whatsoever. And then the next set of contrast and juxtaposition that we see is in the second phrase that I have highlighted, which is to help and to reprove. And so it says that Artisan is someone who, in any case, in any extremity, is inclined to help others rather than to reprove. So he's not quick to judge, right? So even though, even when his friends are in trouble or even when his friends have done something wrong, his first instinct is always to help them get out of trouble and not to chastise them or condemn them. And so again, an indication of him being a decent character. But the interesting thing is that his instinct to help rather than reprove is eventually going to be put to the test when he faces the moral dilemma of Jekyll, when he realizes that Jekyll has dabbled in this sort of transgressive scientific experiment that's kind of bordering on the profane, because obviously Jekyll tries to create this, this devil reincarnate figure through, through Hyde. And so really begs the question as to whether, you know, someone like Utterson, who is not quick to judge, whether or not even someone who is like Utterson deserves to help Jekyll, or whether actually by helping someone like Jekyll, Utterson is in fact complicit in an act of evil. And the next technique is, actually there are two techniques that I want to talk about for this slide, but the first one is foreboding. So this passage, being the very first paragraph, is already chock full of foreboding. So one example is this phrase, it was frequently his fortune to be the last reputable acquaintance and the last good influence in the lives of downgoing men. So what does this sentence mean, yeah? This means that Utterson is always the person who people turn to for help, especially when they're in desperate straits. So that's why he is the last reputable acquaintance, because he is someone who is reputable, while everyone will probably have abandoned all of those who are downgoing, lost their reputation because of, you know, having done something sinful. Utterson is not one to abandon them. He's obviously this incredibly reliable and trustworthy friend. But this also forebodes his role as the confidant and as friend of 
Henry Jekyll. Right? He also ultimately, he kind of helps cover up uh, Jekyll's actions, even though he knows the truth about what happened. Jekyll is the ultimate downgoing man in the novel. So it prepares us once again for Utterson's role as this confidant, right, to these complicated and morally troubled characters like Jekyll and to some extent also Lanyon. The other technique is allusion, specifically biblical allusion in the phrase Cain's heresy when he says, I incline to Cain's heresy. I let my brother go to the devil in his own way. So actually the funny thing is Utterson here is alluding to the Cain and Abel story in a tongue in cheek way. But of course, you know, the original biblical story is gory and tragic because it's about Cain murdering his brother Abel. When Cain murders his brother Abel, God knows and says, what the hell are you doing? And Cain says, well, well, am I my brother's keeper? Implying that, well, I'm not responsible for Abel's well-being. Right. So it's kind of, you know, every man for himself. So don't blame me for it. And so here, Asasin is kind of giving a humorous reinterpretation of that. Because when he says, I let my brother go to the devil in his own way, he's not saying that he doesn't care about other people's well being. And instead, he's saying that he's actually someone who prefers to stay out of other people's business and their decisions in life. Right. Even when he knows that, you know, they are destructive. The thing is, it's dramatically ironic because Asasin is kind of almost forced to partake in other people's businesses not necessarily because he wants to but because of course he's roped into all of the complications and the troubles that's created by his friend Jekyll this is also an example of dramatic irony because we know that ultimately Utterson despite saying here at the start that he's inclined to stay out of other people's business and troubles he is going to be thrown into the deep end going to be involved right in the whirlwind of all of the moral complications and troubles that lie ahead. The final technique that I want to talk about in this quick quote analysis is narrative focalization. Focalization basically refers to point of view, right? Or narrative perspective. So from whose perspective, from whose voice are we looking at the situation? Are we being told about the events in the novel? So in this passage, we see third person omniscient narrative at play. What's third person omniscient narrative? It is an all knowing point of view which provides full insight into the thoughts, feelings, and motives of all characters. Here, we see this actually from the phrase, sometimes wondering, and this is Utterson sometimes wondering, almost with envy at the high pressure of spirits involved in their misdeeds. Basically, what this phrase means is that Utterson finds it almost kind of incredulous and incredible that people would want to go through the anguish and the guilt and the discomfort obviously that comes with committing sins and crimes this feeling that he has of wow i can't believe that you would actually want to put yourself through that pain of committing these misdeeds and these crimes and sins because it's actually really hard so it's almost kind of like this ironic sarcastic well done you for you know putting yourself through the pain and the discomfort that comes with sin also important is how we're able to identify that this passage is an example of third person omniscient narrative is from the words wondering and envy because wondering tells us that we're about to be told what Utterson thinks and envy tells us that this is what he feels but of course if we didn't have this exclusive omniscient insight into Utterson's head and heart, then we wouldn't know what he's wondering and we wouldn't know that he feels envy because it's not as if he tells people this. So that's how we know it's an example of third person omniscient narrative. Even though if we were to look at this passage as a whole, most of the descriptions of Utterson are actually observable from the outside, right? So it can be quite tricky to identify. So just one tip here for you to know, this is how we identify um, third person omniscient narrative. Look for places where clearly we're being told what the character is thinking and also how they feel. This is a dramatically ironic moment as well because towards the end of the novel, we know that Artisan will realise from Jekyll's full statement the case how it is indeed very unenviable and torturous to be involved in any sort of moral misdeed. Of course, you know, here it's ironic that he should say, oh, he feels almost with envy because, of course, he doesn't really feel envy towards the people who commit sin. It's just um, a figure of speech here to kind of highlight his sense of incredulity towards those who would commit sin. The dramatic irony here then is that 
while he's thinking, oh my God, it's so incredible that some people would find committing sin bearable. Well, actually one of his closest friends, Dr. Jekyll, is someone who apparently puts himself through this pain of obviously a huge moral misdeed. So just one more point. It's actually not quite possible for us to ascertain from just one isolated passage what the novel's overall point of view is. With third person omniscience, it can be all and it can be limited. So of course, limited omniscience means that we're only privy to the thoughts and feelings of one character, but we don't know the thoughts and feelings of other characters, right, in the, in the novel. So we can't quite tell from just one short passage like this, but from what we can tell here, I think at least we can, it's safe to say that it is third person omniscient of some sort. As we go on to read the novel, you can find out for yourself whether or not it is an example of third person omniscient uh, or it's limited omniscient. There you go. That's really it for our quick quote analysis. If you found this helpful, please give this a like so that you can help the YouTube algorithm spread my videos to more like-minded, high achieving English lit students like yourself. And if you want to support me, please do subscribe to my channel and hit that bell notification below so that I can continue making these useful English Lit Study videos to help you get top grades in the subject. You can also check out the playlist and the other Jekyll and Hyde videos that I will be linking down in the description below. And finally, if you want to ask me any questions about your studies of literature, then feel free to follow me on Instagram at hyperbolit and shoot me a direct message and I will try my very best to get back to you guys. Thank you for watching as always and I will see you in the next video.